Hello, genealogists. This is Craig, and this is Just Genealogy. And on Saturday, I did a talk on a South Carolina Revolutionary War soldier, John S. Head, a case study for the Ventura Genealogical Society in California. He had a great time, and I recorded it, so I thought I would share it with you. Okay, so I'm hoping that you see a screen that says a South Carolina Revolutionary War soldier, John Stromat Head, a case study. Are we good? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to look at a South Carolina soldier. And the reason that I pick soldiers to do case studies on today is because they end up in Georgia or they end up in Delaware because, and I'll talk about this later, the last and final payments exist on fold three for them. So it, it allows me to get to the end of the show. Um, in, in what we're doing. And by the way, if you have a Revolutionary War soldier that you would like me to do this to, send me an email. I'll give you my, my email is on the handout and I'll also give it to you at the end. And I will try to do the same thing given that I don't get hundreds of Revolutionary War soldiers, but I'll try to do the same thing for your Revolutionary War soldier and see how it works out. Can't promise I'll do it, but I'll put it on the list, the wait list to work on it. So let's get through this. So the first thing that you want to do is identify a possible Revolutionary War soldier. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is identify a possible Revolutionary War soldier. And you all have pedigree charts or anatopples. You want to look for male ancestors born between 1700 and before 1770. 1700 is pretty far back. But I have a Revolutionary War ancestor who I was able to, using the process I'm going to show you today, he was born in 1717, and I have another one born in 1715. They supported the cause. They weren't soldiers, but their, their descendants are eligible for DAR membership. And before 1770, by the end of the war, they could be very young. And I have found people between the ages of seven and 14 who, in fact, served during the revolution. There's a book called Underage Warriors that deals with those. My own ancestor reported that he was a Revolutionary War soldier, but unfortunately, he was born in North Carolina in 1771. He wasn't. He was a War of 1812 soldier, but they threw a parade for him in 1847 in Posey County. Indiana anyway, as a Revolutionary War soldier. He was a strange person. You want to focus on those people born between 1745 and 1765. The kinds of information that you want to know about the person, and all this information you don't have to have before you start, but it's very helpful to you if you do. You want to have the full name of the individual. You want to have an idea of their age, their year of birth, you want to know where they were born. You want to know where they were during the conflict, especially, but before the con conflict may determine where they, in fact, where they serve from, and after the conflict may determine whether you have the right pensioner or not. You also want to know the name of the spouse, because many times the widow will also get a pension. And if you've got people of the same name, like John Smith, Unfortunately, you know his wife is going to be named Mary, but maybe she has a different name and you'll be able to differentiate the various John Smiths by the name of his spouse. The first thing I always do is go and look for them in the census. So here is John S. Head in Georgia in the 1850 federal census. He appears to be deceased by 1860. And in fact, most Revolutionary War soldiers are going to be deceased by 1860. In fact, most are going to be deceased by 1850, but you want to work your way back. He's in the household of James B. Head of, in Cates, Gwinnett County, Georgia. He's 87 years of age, and he seems to be deceased by 1860 because he's not in the 1860 census. And we also know that he's here in Georgia. So that gives us some information about him. I'm going to find him in the 1850 census. I'm going to find him in the 1840 census. 
and I'm just going to do that on Ancestry or Family Search or wherever the censuses can be found. So in the 1840 census, we find a John T. Head. Now, because he's in Georgia, I'm going to look at him and see if it in fact is the person I'm looking for. And here's uh, John S. Head in Campbell County, Georgia. And in the 1840 census, there is a column for Revolutionary War soldiers. And that clearly is a T, but I'm pretty confident that this is the person we're living looking for. He's 77 years old. And remember, in, in, the, in the next census, he is um, in 1850, he was 87. It's crossed out. I really don't know why. That could be an S as well as a T. T's, S's, and L's are always problematic. Uh, I'm going to go with it being an S. We'll see if there's anything else that will substantiate that later on. So what answers do we have so far? John S. or T. Head. Uh, your birth is, he's 77 in 1840, so that makes him born about 1753. That's pretty good. Where is he born? At this point, we don't know. We do know that he's lived after the conflict in Campbell and Gwinnett Counties, Georgia. We don't know the name of his spouse, and we don't know anything about his Revolutionary War service, except that he appears to have had some. So we need to definitely get a place of birth. We need to definitely get the name of a wife. After I do the census research, the next thing I do is I go to dar.org, and I run the ancestor search. And when I do that, I find John, South Carolina, private, born Culpeper, Virginia in 1863. He dies in 1852 in Gwinnett County, Georgia. He does have a pension, and that's the source of his service, and he appears to be serving with a Captain Thomas Farrow, a Captain Potts, and Colonel Benjamin Roebuck's regiment, and it appears that he lived in 96th District of South Carolina, and we now know that his wife's name, according to the DAR, is Barbara. There are also children, and we look at those. There's a James B. Head. There's a Jane, who's the wife of John Ford, and a Nancy, who's the wife of John Garner. And we get that from a screen that shows up uh, on the next page that lists all of the people that people join the DAR through the children of this soldier. So now we know that he's born 1753. He dies in 1852, that he's from Culpeper County, Virginia at Campbell and Gwinnett, we already knew. We know he has a pension now. We have some service for him in South Carolina, and we know his wife, according to DAR, is named Barbara. So the first thing I'm going to do after this is do a literature search on Georgia, because that's where he applies for the pension. And in the first place that I usually go for Georgia soldiers is Ross Arnold and Hank Burnham's Georgia Revolutionary War Soldiers and Sailors, Patriots, and Pioneers which is a two volume set. And my interest there is not so much looking for the information that's there because most of this information by now we already know, but what we're able to add is that he enlisted in 1780 while living in Spartanburg district, South Carolina, that he served at the battle of Cowpens in the siege of 96, that he has uh, an 1827 Georgia land lottery and that he applied for, for a pension from Morgan County, Georgia. That's new information. And we did know before that he resided in Gwinnett County, Georgia. So we did get some specific information about battles. We got some specific information about where he enlisted, those kind of things, and also information about the 1827 Georgia land lottery. What I'm more interested in from this book is not so much the information, but what their sources were for, in fact, looking for information. So we've got George's roster in the revolution. We've got abstracts of some Revolutionary War pensions. I'm actually not going to look at that because we're going to look at the actual pension. Deaths of Revolutionary War soldiers who died in Georgia and their widows and roster of South Carolina patriots in the American Revolution. 
when I look at deaths of Revolutionary War soldiers who died in Georgia and their widows by Jeanette Hall and Austin, there isn't any new information other than what we've, there's nothing that I can add to what we've got there. I look in Georgia's roster of the revolution and I find that he's only listed once in a list compiled by Captain B.F. Johnson from the lottery list of 1827, and that he's a certified list of, uh, on a certified list of Revolutionary War soldiers. So it really doesn't add anything to what we already know, except that he gets that 1827 land lottery when he's a resident of Gwinnett County. Now, because I have Culpeper, Virginia, as where he's from initially in that record, I'm going to go look at Lloyd Boxtruck's Virginia Colonial Soldiers and Murty June Clark's Colonial Soldiers of the South. Now, both these books are on ancestry, so they're not hard to find. This is not Revolutionary War information. This is pre-Revolutionary War information. I always look for the pre-service, the service before the revolution, whenever I work with a Revolutionary War soldier, especially if it's an officer, because this may explain why he's an officer, because he has prior service for, for example, in the French and Indian War or service in Lord Dunmore's War. Those kinds of things are going to be helpful for someone from Virginia. Well, the French and Indian War actually would be helpful for anybody anywhere, but Lord Dunmore's War would be specifically Virginian. I'm also going to look also in Ancestry at the historical register of Virginians in the Revolution. When I look there, I actually don't find anything. When I do a literature search on Culpeper, Virginia, to see if I can find any military service of him in Culpeper, I don't find anything. But remember, we also found that he enlisted from Spartanburg County, South Carolina, and there is a John Head in the history of Spartanburg that is a member of the first grand jury in the county. I'm not sure what that means in regards to what year that was. I uh, just know that it was the first. And that there is a John Head that served in the Civil War and was at Gettysburg. Well, I know that that John Head is not our John Head. So actually, the history of Spartanburg is not much help to us. Usually, the histories of the counties work very well if the family stays in the county. And in this case, we know that he moved to Georgia. Now, because he served from South Carolina, I'm going to look at Bobby Gilmer Moss's book, The Roster of South Carolina Patriots in the American Revolution. And, based, and we're told that he's born on 5 August 1763 in Culpeper, Virginia married to Barber. So we have a conflict between 63 and 53, but we have a date here. Don't really know what the source is yet. And while residing in Spartanburg County District, he enlisted during October 1780. So that's near the end of the war uh, under Captain Thomas Farrow, uh, Captain Potts, and Colonel Roebuck. He was at the Battle of Cowpens in the Siege of 96. And in addition, he was in scouting parties until the end of the war and was discharged after the surrender of Cornwallis. At which, and then after that, he moved to Georgia. So there's an excellent book on the Battle of Cowpens called The Devil of a Whipping by Lawrence E. Babbitts. So you want to go ahead and look for that. Although he doesn't serve at Guilford, there is another book by Babbitts and a co-author, Josh Howard, that is almost as good as this one on Guilford Courthouse, which is a battle after this one. And they're about the same time. And many of the people who participated at Calpins also participated at Guilford Courthouse, but it doesn't appear that uh, Head did that. I'm going to Google Thomas Farrow. And when I do that, I'm going to find a website on the American Revolution in South Carolina, where it's going to tell me what Captain Thomas Farrow was doing. And interestingly enough, the only known private associated with Captain Thomas Farrow on this website is John Head, other than somebody named John Farrow. And the known skirmishes and battles for 
Pharaoh, not for John Head, but for Pharaoh are the Siege of Charleston, Calpins, 96, Edstow River, and Pharaoh Station. So we know that John Head, from what we know so far, was at Calpins in the Siege of 96. The other thing I'm going to look at is the Continental Army. And this book is published by the Government Printing Office. Pieces of it are available online. It deals with Continental Line soldiers. It does not deal with militiamen like John Head, but I want to bring it to your attention. It's available as piece, the pieces are available on the Center for Military History website, but I would get the book. Now, the book is excellent, and it tells you where all the Continental Line units at the company level were raised. So the next thing I'm going to do, having done this literature search on everything I could know about him individually from various sources, I'm going to go look at his Revolutionary War pension. I know that he has one according to the DAR. So I'll go and I'll find the pension. And this shows his name, shows he served from South Carolina. Because that S is there, he got a pension. It could be a W there, and there would be a name of a widow underneath his name. It could be, there could be an R there because it was a rejected pension. The S actually stands for survivor. It does not stand for soldier. Women also, women who were not, some women who were not soldiers also got pensions. Very few, but some. Also, you might see on this envelope, uh, bounty land, but there's no bounty land there. You'll see something in the upper right-hand corner, if there is, it says BLWT, and then it will give a certificate number, and then it will give the number of acres, in this case, 160, and then the act, which in this case is the act of 1855, which is the last bounty land warrant act. It's sort of an equalizing act. If you ever find somebody who has less than 160 acres of land, you want to go and see where there might be other land because everybody was entitled to at least 160 acres under the Act of 1855. Now, if you find your Revolutionary War soldier got bounty land under the Act of 1850, the truth of the matter is he also served in the War of 1812. The Act of 1850 does not apply to Revolutionary War soldiers. There was such a crew, uh, uh, such uh, an outpouring of dissent after the 1850 Act by Revolutionary War soldiers because they were not included in the Act that the government decided to have this final Act in 1855. It may be that there are two or more pensions in one envelope. There might be a survivor pension, there may be the accepted widow's pension, but there may be a rejected widow's pension or a rejected soldier's pension in there, a rejected survivor pension. What you want to do is to separate the people, then put the pieces in chronological order. You can download the entire Revolutionary War file from Fold 3. Belonging to Fold 3 is a good thing in that to purchase a Revolutionary War pension from the National Archives, which all they're really going to do is download it from Fold 3 and put it on a disk for you. But for what you would pay them to do that, you can belong to Fold 3 for a year and have access to all the Revolutionary War pensions, along with everything else that's out on Fold 3. So when we look at, this is the actual pension envelope. It's a, it's a trifold. It, this is what Originally, the pension uh, was surrounded by this. Uh, it's not, it's more like cardstock than anything. And we see that he gets a pension under the act of March of 1831. This tells me that likely he's a militiaman. Well, we've already per pretty much determined that um, because it, Roebuck was a South Carolina militia colonel. And it does, in fact, say right up there that he's in the South Carolina militia. So the 1831 act is the first time that militiamen are able to get pensions unless they were disabled early on in the war. Now, when we describe that pension act of March, 1831, everybody calls it the act of 1832 because that's 
the soonest that someone is actually able to get a pension is 1832, if they're a militiaman. But it's retroactive to March of 1831. So we're going to see a payment eventually, and we'll get to that point eventually. One of the nice things about pensions are you're going to find usually a signature. That's always helpful in being able to track down a person and being able to differentiate one John S. Head from another John S. Head. There may be a Bible record, and these are very difficult to read. Now, in the original microfilm, these are reverse photostats, and when Fold 3 fixed it to put them online, they made them regular. Uh, my experience in looking at these in the original Revolutionary War records, which I've done on two occasions, fortunately, um, is that looking at the originals is no better than looking at the um, digital copy. This I will tell you the first time I looked at an original Revolutionary War pension was on the 2nd of August, 1969. Robot and was, from uh, that South point Carolina on, I was hooked. Colonel. And that's one of the reasons why I'm fact say right talking there to there you today because of that day. But in the files, usually you will find a pension office letter. Now, this is where the pension office is responding to or the government is responding to some other letter. So there are two kinds of letters in pensions. One is from the pension agency or the pension office or the treasury or someone in government. And the other is to somebody in government. Those that are from the pension office, the pension division, you can trust because they are in fact a roadmap for what you can actually find in the pension. And here in this letter, you will see that that Bible record was transcribed in the letter. Even though you can't read it now, it can be found in the letter. Now, you'll also find letters to the pension office, the pension division, the pension agency. These you can take with a grain of salt. I once found one for an Enoch Fur in Loudoun County, Virginia, that said that Enoch came with Lafayette from France to serve in the revolution. Lafayette was born, uh, not Lafayette, was Lafayette was born in France, but Enoch Fur was born in Fauquier County, Virginia, and at the age of six, according to his pension, he, his family, moved to Loudoun County, Virginia. So there's no way he went back to France to come with Lafayette when Lafayette came. The other thing you want to do, and I recommend that you do this, is you transcribe the pension. Because if you look at the pension and you see a word that you don't quite understand, your brain will just go right over it. It'll fill it in and you won't worry about it. But if you transcribe the pension, you're forced to look at the words and determine what they actually are. Now, many Southern pensions are already transcribed and are available online uh, through the Southern Pension Project, which you can get to rather easily just by Googling Southern Pension Project. But the other thing I always do is I look for the name of the individual in somebody else's pension, which is very easy to do now. In the old days, it wasn't easy at all. And we normally didn't do it just because it wasn't easy. But it's now easy to go find John in somebody else's pension. And in fact, he's mentioned in the pension of John McDade. And largely it's because they both lived in Gwinnett County and they reinforced each other in regards to getting their pension. So look, these two guys did not serve together. They just lived in the same county when they were, when they were getting their pensions. So when we look at that pension, what do we learn? We realize it's the act of 1831. We know he's a militiaman who served long enough to get a pension under the Act of 1831, so we know he served at least six months. We know now that he moved to Elbert County, Georgia, and then to Gwinnett County, Georgia, with his son James, and then Morgan County, Georgia, where he applied for a pension 11 July 1848, and that he's mentioned in the pension file of John McDade. Now, there's no widow's pension to be found in that envelope. So we know he has children 
based on the 1850 census, the 1860 census, but we have no indication so far of what the name of his wife might have been, except that it's Barbara, and we don't know when she died at this point. What would we learn if we found a widow's pension? We would learn the marriage date, when and where. We would learn the maiden name and that it was her first marriage or whatever marriage it might have been. And then because of what act she was paid under, we would know uh, the, the pension acts begin in 1836 for widows. And until 1855, they're based on when they marry. So even if we don't have a marriage date, and where in the pension, which we should, maybe we have a rejected pension. We will know by, and because there's no marriage date there, we'll know when she may have gotten married by the act that she's applying under. And that's just a general guideline. But 1836, she would have been married to the soldier during his, in, during his service prior to the expiration of his service in the Revolutionary War. And basically, it, over time, it changes to 1790, to 1800. And then by 1855, you find a whole bunch of very young women marrying very old men because old men with pensions are rich. They get $8 a month at least. Now, there is a Military Pension Act uh, book, pension law book by Christine Rose. You can get it separately. Or if you get her bounty land book, it's an appendix in her bounty land book. But this will tell you what all the acts are. And what did we learn from of his service? We learned about his militia service with Captain Farrow and Potts and Colonel Roebuck's regiment. And we know that he's enlisted a private, not an officer. And so we've got Farrow and Jay Potts. We've got Benjamin Roebuck. We know he joined General Morgan before Calpins and then joined General Pickens before 96. This is all information that's in the pension, that he was at the Battle of Calpins and the Siege of 96, that he it, did get a survivor pension. There's no, no mention of him being a prisoner. He did get a certificate of indent. And we know that he married Barbara on 19 June, 1771 but her maiden name and place where they married is not named. We do know that there's the preacher of the gospel who did it, and it's that their marriage is signed, uh, their, the affidavit of their marriage is signed by Alexander H. Stevens, who's a member of the House of Representatives in 1846. I did go back and look to see if the marriage might have occurred in Culpeper, County, and I looked at John Vogt's Culpeper marriages. There are uh, two head marriages listed there, but they are not John. So somewhere between Culpeper and Spartanburg District, South Carolina, whose marriages I did not look at because I don't have those readily available to me, um, they got married. So my guess is if I were to find the Spartanburg marriage register, I would find their name on it likely although I don't know, time would tell. So we know what his service is, so we're gonna wanna look for a compiled military service record. Now recognize that I'm looking for the compiled military service record after I've looked at the pension. Because if you look at the compiled military service first, you won't know that you've got the right person or not. If you look at the pension, it'll tell you what the service is. However, there's no compiled military service record to be found for John Head. And largely, most militia units are like that. There are very few militia records out there. But just because he doesn't have a compiled military service record doesn't mean they didn't serve. And obviously, he served because he has a pension. It's possible to have a compiled military service record and no pension. It's possible to have no compiled military service record and have a pension. It's possible to have no compiled military service, have no pension, and still eventually be able to prove their service. So this is a sample of another Virginian who served from Virginia. This is Aaron Williams. And I took this from um, a legacy seminar that I did on researching. And uh, my case study was Aaron Williams. And basically what you wanna do, this is the envelope um, that contains all of his compiled military service record material. 
and I, I basically I create a timeline of all of the payrolls, muster rolls, and all those kind of things. In this case, there were a, a good number of pieces inside uh, his envelope. You want to definitely look at his muster in and what, who's he with. This happens to be one where he's at Valley Forge. He's actually on furlough while his company is at Valley Forge, but it's likely he was at Ver Valley Forge. And because of the circumstances there, they sent him home on furlough. There may be certificates for balance of pay, those kind of things. What you're going to learn from the compiled military service record is what service did they have uh, specifically by date, any medical information that might be included in the compiled military service record, and were they on furlough. Generally, you're not going to find furloughs in the pension, but you want to compare all you learn in a compiled military service record, if there is one, to what you learned in the pension. You also want to find the original muster rolls, and these are on fold three. So if there is a compiled military service record, there should be a muster roll on fold three. And these are easy to find on fold three. And here is William Aaron in a muster payroll of his time in the 10th Virginia Regiment. The next thing I'm going to look for, and sometimes I will do this before I do the pension for no real reason, it's just I'm very familiar with these last and final payment indexes. And these are on full three. And here we see John S. Head has a, a last payment, not a final payment, but a last payment in Georgia under the Act of 1832. And that payment was dated for September 1852. And note that there's an asterisk there. So this tells me that we will be able to find that last payment in the National Archives. Now, because it's Georgia, and this is the reason I picked a Georgia person, that last and final payment will be found on full three. A last payment is the last time that a pensioner shows up at a pension office and the last time the pension agency sees him. There are lots of reasons for a last payment. The pensioner may have moved, the pensioner may have died, no one picked up the final payment, or the pensioner doesn't need the hassle for eight bucks anymore every month. That's not a very good reason. Everybody likes eight bucks. The final payment though, and that's what you hope for, is these are payments made to heirs from the date of last payment to the date of death. And until 1867, these payments were made to heirs. They were, after 1867, these payments are made to people most responsible for the final care of the individual. These final payments may occur decades after the death of a pensioner. These last and final payments are found in the National Archives in Record Group 217. That's the records of the accounting officers of the Department of Treasury, Entry 722. So let's look at one with no asterisk. This is Hedgeman Triplet. It doesn't have an asterisk. So where would I go? Well, Many times on those cards, you'll see reference to 6 April or April 1838 or Act of 1838, those kind of things. It's entry 724 in Record Group 217. I enjoyed these so much, I created a finding aid for these called the Lost Pensions. I had to do it twice uh, because I did it by box number. And three months after I created the first one, they flat filed all of them and none of the box numbers were any good. So you can see on the top, box 26, 5100 is an account, whereas in the bottom on the right-hand side, it's 1839 and 5100. So here what we have are three entries where the children of Hedgeman Triplet are coming in to find that information. There also was a fourth entry in the previous version. That's a card, and when they, when they flat-filed everything, they got rid of the cards, both basically those were checkout cards. When you order these, you have to order them by name of pensioner, uh, pension office, and the year. You can order it by box number, but that means the archives has to do a crosswalk. There is a finding aid. Um, there's a copy of the finding aid in the central research room. So you can look at them that way. 
and by account number. I will tell you that the archives is working on getting all the last and final payments up on fold three, but they're what progress they've made, nobody will tell me. And I actually haven't visited the archives in a number of years because of COVID. I can't wait to get there. But as I said, the final payment vouchers for Georgia are on fold three. So this is sort of your last step. This is the file for John Head being paid under the um, Act of 1832. So there are several documents in there. You, if there are any witnesses on these documents, you want to track them down uh, because these are people that John Head knows. Now, in the interim, while we're waiting for these final payments to get up, there are last and final payment um, publications done by Allison Turby Pierce or Catherine Gunning um, for uh, various states. What's missing from this list is Rhode Island. Um, and I forgot that I had forgotten that. But anyway, Alabama, District of Columbia, Louisiana, Maryland, Mississippi, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, and Virginia all have published abstracts of these final last and final pension payments. After seeing that, I would want to go to the pension ledgers. And you can do that by typing into the pen ancestry catalog 1818 to 1872. And we'll see that there are two pension ledgers for John S. Head from Georgia. So when we look at those, we can see John S. Head in a Georgia Act of uh, 1832, and we see him getting payments, all those ones. Those are first quarter. The four is fourth quarter. The three is third quarter. So this is, um, this is one set. And this can act as a census because generally with a census, you know that they're in one census, they're in one state, and other census, they're in another state. And you've got this 10-year window and you don't really know when they moved. But if they're a pensioner, you know within six months of when they moved. They were eligible for a pension in March or September of if they qualified for the pension in March and September of every year, and they would go to a pension agent to get the money. And pension agents were found in banks because banks have vaults. So there were no federal buildings in this time frame. So they would go or someone with their power of attorney would go to the bank that was a pension agency and they would get their payment that way. Here's the other, the second piece of that. And there's John S. Head again. He blow that up a little bit for you. So you can see that you can see that the last time he picks his pension up is in September of 1851. That would tell me that there's a good chance he would have died sometime after, it could be any time after the 1st of September of 1851, but it's more than likely that he died in the first quarter of 1852. We don't know that. I mean, I mean, actually, we do know that. Uh, we do know that he died in 1852. Um, but based on this record, we just know that he picked up his last pension in, uh, in the fourth quarter of 1851. Now, if you find this confusing, I wrote a book on understanding Revolutionary War and invalid pension ledgers, 1818 to 1872, and the pension payment vouchers they represent. And there are case studies in those that will help you to follow through uh, if you're having difficulty with it. Uh, most people don't go to the pension ledgers, but they're rich in information. Let's talk about bounty land. There are two kinds of bounty land. There's state bounty land and there's federal bounty land. The best book for military bounty land is written by Christine Rose. It is almost out of print. And from what I understand, she does not intend to reprint it, but this book gives me a headache. It's so detailed. There, once you have this book regarding bounty land, you really don't need anything else. Uh, there is another book on land and property research by Hone, which will fill the void once the bounty land book is out of print because he deals with bounty land in several chapters of his book. On ancestry, there are the, some bounty land warrants. Uh, there are both U.S. bounty land warrants and there are also the state uh, an indication of state awards. So there is, um, the government takes over uh, bounty land uh, 
with the military district of Ohio. And then for Virginia, they take over bounty land with the Virginia military district. All these other military districts here are state bounty land districts. If you Google land records for veterans of the Revolutionary War, you'll get this map very quickly. There are several different versions of it. There are versions that deal with Revolutionary War and 1812, but I, this one is just the Revolutionary War. So Virginians' state land was in southwestern Kentucky. Federal land was in Ohio, just as an example. Basically, the government created those military districts in Ohio because they got tired of Pennsylvania and Connecticut and Virginia trying to claim the Ohio land and fighting each other about it. So the government said, we'll take over your bounty land requirement if you will cede to us your claim to land in the Northwest Territory. There are various script acts that are out there. Notice there's no T in script out there. Uh, for moving between various federal domains as the land runs out. This is an, an act in 1852 that deals with Continental Line Virginia and Continental Virginia Navy that is very useful if you've, going to, if you've got somebody who served from Virginia. We're not going to find John Head there. Although he's a Virginian, he served from South Carolina. There, the land warrants are out there um, on Ancestry, and you can just search for them by name. I always recommend you use the card catalog. So go in and look for U.S. War Bounty Land Warrants, and then plug the name in rather than do a general search. This is what a warrant looks like. Unfortunately, the John Head that has the military warrant on Ancestry is not the John Head from South Carolina. It's the John Head who served in the Maryland line. And I think what we'll find is this John Head actually eventually will live in Pennsylvania. The other thing that I always do is I always look for everybody, not just Revolutionary War people, but for anybody that is my um, ancestor. I'm going to go look and see if they ever qualified for bounty land. And I'm going to do that through the Bureau of Land Management patent search screen. And when we look, uh, we find this is an example of um, William Aaron, the guy who's filling in my spots for when John Head doesn't have something. And here's William Aaron and his wife, Rebecca. Um, basically, William, assigned, by his death, assigns his land to his wife, Rebecca, and Rebecca assigns the land to Josiah G. Hutchison there in the center of the screen. And Hutchison will eventually get land in Douglas uh, County, Kansas. The issue being that although people may assign it, you still want to see whether they qualified for the land or not. And when you go a little farther, this is how he qualifies for the land. And he qualified for the land under the Act of 1855. If you'll see the word authority in the center of the screen, March 3rd, 1855, Script Warren Act of 1855, 10 stat 701. So we know that he likely got this for Revolutionary War Service because it's the Act of 1855 and it's 160 acres. So there's no need for us to look farther back for other Revolutionary War bounty land because he's only entitled to 168, 160 acres in his lifetime. There is a patent. Um, it doesn't really say anything except William Aaron was a revolutionary, a private and a Revolutionary War soldier. There is state bounty land, and the revolutionary governments use land as a tool to create support for the revolution. Everybody knew that if they didn't win the war, they wouldn't get that land. Unfortunately, there's no state bounty land for Delaware, New Jersey, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, or Vermont, because they are landlocked. You're going to want to look at Lloyd Boxtruck's Revolutionary War Bounty Land Grants awarded by state governments. Unfortunately, there's no John Head to be found in that. There is the Virginia Land Office online, and many of the land office records are, in fact, online. In the case of, um, here's one, a land grant issued in 1783. 
that's available to give you some idea about what they look like. Because um, John Head was from Georgia, I'm going to go to the Family Search Wiki to look at Georgia land and property. That is going to take me to Georgia Head Rights and Bounty Land Records, 1783 to 1909. And we're going to find John Head there, but not a John Head in Gwinnett County. We, uh, so here's one for William Aaron uh, when he's living in Wilkes County, the kind of information that you'll find there. So William Aaron gets 160 acres from the federal government and 100 acres from the Georgia state government. And he manages another 200 acres from the Georgia state government. I did mention that John Head had an intent and this is his uh, indent. That's what the squirrely stuff on the left-hand side really means. That's the indent part of it. Uh, these are the South Carolina audited accounts. The pension mentioned an indent. Bobby Moss mentioned an indent. It's number 3483 alpha. That means it, that number, um, there are a few others of those for him, but um, they are for his militia duty in Roebuck's regiment after the fall of Charleston to the British in 1780. So it looks like he joined up after the fall of Charleston. So other sources they're gonna look for, Revolutionary War State Pension, didn't find one. Abstracts of Graves of Revolutionary War Soldiers, didn't find anything. Statutes at Large, Library of Congress I'm gonna look at. South Carolina State Library I'm gonna look at. So Statutes at Large is another one of those places that I put everybody's name into. Nothing was found. State Pensions, this is another book by Boxtruck. Uh, some states have been published in addition to this massive doorstop that contains all the states. Uh, nothing was found there. I'm going to wander through Fold 3 uh, just for fun, see what I might have missed. Another resource is uh, the Pictorial Field Book of the Revolution. It's not going to help me with individual people, but it's going to give me context for like battles, those kind of things. So I would look at Cowpens, I would look at the Battle of 96, those kind of things. And Heritage Book sells this on a CD. They also have 1812 and the Civil War, but this is, this is pretty good. I trust it as far as I can throw it, but I like having it around. Um, I'm nearing the end. Um, I have several uh, more in-depth looks at the Revolutionary War out there, a five-set series on the Revolution out on Legacy Family Tree, if you're interested. Um, I have uh, created, since March of this year, a YouTube channel called Just Genealogy, where every day I talk about something. Every Sunday, I talk about books. Every Saturday, I talk about genealogy standards. And then between the weeks, I talk about questions that people have for me. You're welcome to send me questions. And here's my email. And I am done. I'll leave that up a little bit. We had a couple of um, uh, comments um, that was very informative. Uh, Judy Janes mentioned, uh, our member mentioned that um, we can access the pet, the um, the pension records from the Revolutionary War through Heritage Quest. Uh, the Camarillo Library has a subscription to that. And then we have a couple questions. If you've got time, uh, sure. Craig. If I could add thing yes. something uh, about Heritage Quest. When Heritage uh, Quest first put the pensions out, they only put out the selected pensions, not the full pensions. So make sure when you're looking at it at Heritage Quest in the library that you're looking at the full pension and not the selected pensions. Okay. There's just the possibility that uh, the selected pensions are 10 to 13 pages and the full pension can be hundreds of pages. Oh, I see. Thanks. Sure. Uh, uh, Pat Thomas wanted to know um, something about indents. Why were those issued as indents? What is the significance of the indent on the document? Um, I, I guess the easiest way to deal with that is it was an identification thing. 
So if I take a piece of paper and I basically cut it, the government would keep one copy and I would keep the other copy. And then when they came together, they would know they had the same individual and it was the same document. So notice there's a little, there's a little blip in there. So that little blip is here. So that's why it's called an indent because they didn't do it as simply as I did it. They did it with a lot more curves, but that's what it was. It was an identification thing. So it was a way of preventing fraud. Uh, Pat also says, uh, Craig, thank you for going to the trouble of presenting this educational material in the form of a case study. It makes the important information much more accessible and easier to see the why rather than just the how. Yeah, I mean, I had to be 70 years old before I came to that conclusion. I mean, seriously, I decided when I hit 70 that I was going to shave my head, change what I, how I was teaching, and teach people step by step how to do things from now on. So I'm having to take 30 years worth of data and redo it in this way this is the second revolutionary war person i've done aaron williams is the other one and aaron williams is up on legacy um if and and he's an in-depth look also i still have yet to prepare I, I did a mexican war one and i've got to do a war of 1812 one but they're all going to be out on my youtube channel i have 250 video more than 250 videos out on my youtube channel right now Okay. Of relating to everything relating to genealogy so it's um, and, um shirley comments that um that you offer heritage books discounts during some of your youtube talks Is absolutely that... anywhere from 20 to 40 percent that's great um cheryl layman says excellent presentation and discussion craig thank you very much uh roberta has a question this may be off topic, but how would one research a Revolutionary War ancestor who was a royalist and fought on the king's side? Can you recommend resources? I can. I've done two videos on loyalists that are also on leg Legacy Family Tree. Ah. One is on the loyalist soldiers themselves and how to research a loyalist. The other is dealing with the loyalists who stayed behind, the reintegration of loyalists in back into American society. Okay. So either one of those is going to cover the subject. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, let's see, we have some more thank yous. Very uh, great presentation. If you have a relative living in Northwest South Carolina in the late 1700s, could their land likely have come from one of the bounty land distributions? Yeah, it is possible because if you go and look at that map on that relates to um, where the bounty districts are, the district in South Carolina is in the Northwest. But I would have the expectation that I would find that individual's name in Box Truck's book on state awards. Now, the best part about Box Truck's book on state awards is the information in the front, because he goes through state by state what the procedures, policies, whatever were for that state. And that's that's also very helpful. Georgia and Maine, now Maine doesn't become a state until 1820, but Georgia and Maine both allowed for bounty land to be issued to people who did not serve from Georgia or Maine. So of lots of Virginians you see move to Georgia to get the Georgia bounty land because they're not being offered and North Carolinians too, because state bounty land in North Carolina was only to the officers. It wasn't to the enlisted folks. So you see a lot of North Carolina people moving to Georgia to be able to take advantage of Georgia bounty land. Okay. And um, Craig, uh, Pat Thomas would like to thank you for speaking with them at Salt Lake City, um, even though you don't remember it, you would like to say thank you. Well, hey, Craig, hey, Craig, yeah. you and I were chatting in the hallway and I explained that I was going to be meeting with everybody to hand out name tags. And you said, oh, would you like me to answer questions? And I oh, said, oh, I remember that now. Okay. Oh, yeah. I do. Yeah. Can you 
you very generously talked for an hour answering <laughs> the, the most amazing questions. So thank you again for your generosity. Well, yeah. actually, they're out on legacy. There's there is a legacy thing called Stump Craig, which is an hour of me doing that for for legacy where they gave me questions ahead of time, which is not how I normally operate. But any time that the, your society wants me to do uh, a session as a stump Craig like that, you know, as part of your monthly program, I will be happy to because I'll answer a question on anything because really it's so easy to do that because I know how to guide people. I can't tell you who your third great grandfather is, but I can guide you to the sources that you need to be looking at to find your third great grandfather. Uh, very good. Well, th thank you so much again, Craig. Um, we, we probably need to have a short break now. Um, then we will have our second speaker, uh, Bear Belt Johnson, who will speak to us about German ancestors um, finding your German ancestors in um, newspaper records. All right. And Kathy, what time do you want everyone to be back? I can modify the slide. Yeah, please. let's come back at 2.40. 2.40, okay. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. And Thank I'm, you, Craig. This has been terrific. If there's people who want to stay for a little bit longer to just answer any question about anything until you start your next session, I'll stay that long. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. Sure. Craig? Yes. Can you hear me? My name is Karen. Um, so um, am I understanding this right? If I email you some of the basic parameters of somebody I know that was a direct bloodline that served in the New Jersey militia, you'll help get me started? Because I've just been dipping my toe into sure. things and now I'm ready to do some deep dives. Sure. If his name is Blackford, I'd like it even better. Nope. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but he's he's my um he's my American relation that I don't know where he came from to get here. He, well, he's I, I can't pro I can't promise when I will do it. I'll just put it on the list, though. That'd be great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This has been awesome. I I learned so much. <laughs> Craig, yes, this Marilyn. is Marilyn. This is Marilyn. Yes. Um, my. I don't know how many great grandfathers it was, but um, he was German, arrived in 1753 and um, in Pennsylvania, York County. And he, and along with about 16 other guys were tried for misprision of treason in the revolution. Um, we, found, we know they were acquitted, but we can't find any other information about Okay, them. so the first, the first place I would look is Nagel's book on summer time soldiers, I think it's called. It originally was an ancestry book. It's out of print, but it is the general orders associated with court marshals. Well, I'm not even sure they were. Um, but you still have to look because you're not sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and is, um, that, is that book in your syllabus? No, because we didn't talk about, we didn't talk about Revolutionary War court martials. Um, okay. But there's only so much you can talk about in an hour. Uh, right, right. Yeah. But, but that's the book you want to look for. There also is a can new you give me the, set. Can you give me the name again? It's it's by uh, it's by Nagels. Uh-huh. And it's called Summer Something Soldiers, Summertime Soldiers, or something like that. Okay. And it, it deals with Revolutionary War court martials okay. based on what's found in the court order books. Now, recently, I mean, two brand new books that just came out that don't necessarily deal with the with the charge that you're talking about, but he loves a good deal of rum, military desertions during the American Revolution. Volume one is from 1775 to 1777, and volume two is from June of 1777 to 1783, and they're by uh, Joseph Lee Boyle, and these are brand new books that have just come out. So if you've got a deserter in the revolution, I mean, I haven't even looked at these yet. They're still sitting on my desk waiting for me to get to them. I just know that they're there. The, the theory is by some who, and they've researched the records in York County. So you, you're not, we can't find anything in the court or anything like that. 
But um, these guys just got tired of providing for the army and they said, no, we're not gonna do it. Is that, uh, does that seem plausible? Oh yes, very much so. So basically they, they supported till a point that they became loyalists. And because they were loyal, <laughs> because they were no longer supporting, they therefore, the rules concerning loyalists applied to them and they weren't on our side anymore, so we'll fix them. But they were acquitted and they were all Germans. Yeah, because everybody realized that everybody was fed up with supporting the Continental Line by that point in time. Okay. So it wasn't, it wasn't a bad, it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. And you can tell that by the fact that they all remained in New York County. Right, they did. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, so even even though being acquitted, you can be acquitted for things that everybody knows you're guilty of, OJ. So um <laughs> so so recognize that you know if if they stayed behind in the county, everybody pretty much agreed that th their situation was just sort of what a shame, but not really bad. Whereas if they would have been forced to leave the county that would have been entirely different. Okay, well, that's good. That, that's good insight, thank you. And um, Marilyn, uh, Kira posted in the chat that the book is Summer Soldiers, a survey and index of Rev Revolutionary War Courts Martial by James Nagel. So you can snag that there. And okay, Judy posted that we have several books by Joseph Lee Boyle in our VCGS library collection. Yeah, so. he's prolific. He publishes with both both me and GPC. So, I mean, I've got a eight volume set on letters from Valley Forge from him. Uh, Craig, and, this yes. is Jim. Um, I, I uh, looked up researching a, a Loyalist soldier um, through family tree webinars and you yes. talked about a second one that you yes. did. Yes, if you just look at me as a speaker, they'll all show up. Okay, okay, great, great. Um, and and what one one real fun experience we had traveling on the East Coast was going to the David Library of the American Revolution. Um, it was which doesn't was, exist anymore. It doesn't exist. It's now it's in, supposedly in in Philadelphia. Right. I don't know. It's integrated with uh, I, I I can't remember exact. I, it's either the Antiquarian Society or the Philosophical Society. I I, I, I haven't right. been there yet, so. Um, I have been to the David Library. In fact, I got to spend three days there where wow. they put me up for three days. It was so much fun, largely because some of my heroes were there researching. The expert on Brits, the expert on Hessians. And I also have, if you've got Hessians, I also have a talk on Hessians up on Legacy Family Tree also. And then the guy, and then the Loyalist guy. So all three of those guys were right there. And I walked in the door and it was like, it was like, I didn't, I knew one of them, but I didn't know all of them. And it was like, hi, Craig. And it was like, it was really a shock for me that these three guys even knew who I was. It was kind of cool. That's great. Yeah, very cool. Anybody else? You can ask me about any war. It doesn't have to be the revolution. I just have to say, I had no idea there were so many different record sets related. I mean, it makes sense. I just had no idea there were so many and in so many different places. So this yeah, has been very so many enlightening. Different places. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I didn't talk about, though, was there is the ancestor search, but there's also a another search there whose name is descendant search. And what I do is I take every single one of my ancestors and plug them into descendant search because their name may show up on somebody's application. So and that's I took a the guy, DAR, right? DAR. Right, in DA, at DAR.org. So I took a guy who... I, I knew him and I knew his daughter, and he was in Orange County, Virginia in 1850. And that's all I knew about him was his name was uh, Henry Bell, and his daughter was Mahalia. And I plugged Henry Bell into dar.org, saw that he had this this application had a daughter named Mahalia, and it th this is the one that took me back to the 1815 and 1817 families. So I picked up literally uh three more generations and if not four and seven more surnames and it was just so much fun and it was simple now do i believe it all no 
But what I'm dealing with is clues that I can then work on to build on and find out what I do believe at some point. That's a great tip. Mm. Thank you. Oh, in fact, uh, talking about loyalists, I've just written an article for the National Genealogical Society magazine. So at some point in the future, there will be an article on loyalists and the reintegration. It's been submitted. I mean, I'm, I'm done with it, except getting the draft back and finishing it up. So it should be within the next six months or so. Hey, Craig, this yes. is Pat Thomas again. I'd like to mm -hmm. put in a pitch for the fact that you are doing the independent research, the guided research section at the Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy. Yeah, I've been doing the it for years. Yeah, the virtual presentation this coming January. And actually, I'm going to be in Salt. But the plan is for me to actually be in the library in Salt Lake that week. That's that's what I'm trying to work out right now. I'm building. I'm outfitting a 2004 Sprinter van so I can travel the country and visit military parks, libraries. I just visit, I spoke to the Tennessee Genealogical Society last Saturday, and I did a video on their library and Brilliant. what they have in their library and that kind of stuff. So I'm going to travel the country and any society that'll let me do a video, I'll do it. Museums, oh, those kind of things. That's great. Well, I also, and, when it runs, I also am the host of the DC NGS research tour for touring the DR library, the Library of Congress and uh, the National Archives. And I've been doing, except for COVID, I've been doing that for years too. I. I my goal in life is converting people doing genealogy into genealogists. I mean, there's a difference between those two groups of people. And I it's my passion to help people become better genealogists. At least I think it's my passion. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Craig. Sure. Anybody else? Yeah, Craig, this is Shannon. Uh -huh. um, are there as many sources of information for the Vietnam War as some of the others? The problem with the Vietnam War is the Privacy Act and all those kind of things. The best way to research someone in the Vietnam War, especially after the 1973 fire, is because the war ended in 73, um, is to trace the unit. And because so much has been written about the war at the unit level, the first thing you want to do is know the unit of the guy, then track down any books that may exist on the unit. I, I truly am not a modern military guy. I sort of end at World War I, but the how you would research a World War I soldier is pretty much the same way you would research anybody in World War II, Korea, Vietnam. You want to focus on the unit. Okay. But because it wasn't that long ago, you want to find out who was in the, if the person isn't alive anymore, you want to find out who was in the unit with him and interview them because whatever they did, he did. Okay. Now, if they're deceased, if the individual is deceased, you also want to go to the VA and see what records they have for him. Will they let anybody have the records? Or if you're the kid of that person they will oh no i'm i'm the niece well are there any kids of that person yes then have them do it okay now for world war ii you could do it because there are archival records now but for korea almost you could do it depending on the year of discharge uh, because it may not have caught up yet but for Vietnam, you have to be a niece or a wife or a mother or a father. Uh, did I say niece? You need to be a yes. son, daughter, um, mother, father. Uh, okay. They won't accept niece. Okay. Okay. And, Hi, this is, oh, sorry. And for anybody that heard my presentation on the fire at the National Archives at the NPRC, there's that thing about Hubbard James. Before Hubbard James, there may be a record. And after Hubbard James, it's just a lot less likely. This is Gail. Can I ask a question about a World War II veteran? Sure. 
So my uncle served, uh, he was actually stationed at Pearl Harbor, you know, during the bombing, but, and he ended up serving in the Pacific until the very end, past the war at the end of 1945. And I've been looking at his full medical records or full uh, service records. And it seems that in that rush to get everybody out the door, his records just sort of end and there's so much missing. And I looked and I know that he would be eligible for maybe five awards he was never given or nominated for, um, you know, for all the campaigns he was in. And um, did they, did anyone ever go finish those records? It seems like everybody was just sent home and they just never completed his record. Well, had someone queried the government about those things at the appropriate time, they would have completed the record, but because nobody queried the government and asked for the medals, they didn't complete it. Okay. So that, so you can go, there is, there is an awards branch in the Pentagon and mm -hmm. you can go look and see and 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 deal with that deal with it that way um mm -hmm. but there i'm not sure what five awards he may have been eligible for so uh, that well seems... i look through the list of all the awards and the the um, criteria for all those awards that were available for that time I, I i don't maybe it was three or four but there were a lot of things that he should have gotten and and and, and he didn't at his funeral they had like two measly things like good conduct award he was in the marines good conduct reward award and you know something and that was it and he had fought through that whole war but, from, from but uh, his discharge paperwork should identify what awards he, were due him mm -mm, at, didn't the, have at the time anything. of discharge and there was a note in the records that said because of the volume and the end of the war that there were a lot of that that his record was incomplete yeah I mean, it actually stated that on there yeah, um, so you can yeah. provide that information to the to the awards board at the mm -hmm. Pentagon and see what they okay. have to say. Yeah, I'd like to do that for my cousin so that they can get you know their their father's awards. Sure. Um, okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. This has been great. Everyone sure. is now. I'm I'm going to leave you now so I can end the recording and you Perfect. all can catch up later and let me Perfect. know what's going on. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very all very much. much for having me today. Sorry, I'm so casual, but. I mean, we love casual. Be, We're from it. Ventura. <laughs> yeah, that's actually what I thought. I thought I'd be in good shape. No coat yeah. and tie for me today. No, thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much, Craig. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right.